Lily Danzis, and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Great Smokies Writing Program, and welcome to our April 2022 session of Writers at Home. Thank you all for joining us today as we celebrate National Poetry Month with the reading from students in Eric Nelson's Poetry Masterclass. And as always, we're so grateful to Malaprops for giving us this virtual space. If you're looking for a way to support Malaprops, we have a wonderful opportunity coming up. Um, Eric Nelson has a book of poems, Horse Not Zebra, coming out very soon on April 18th, um, and you can pre-order it now through Malaprops. So it's a win all around situation. You get to read some fantastic poetry while supporting a local poet in a local bookstore. So if you're looking for a next read, um, definitely check it out. And you can find the direct link to pre-order Horse Not Zebra on the Malaprops calendar listing for this event at malaprops.com slash event. So I have a few more quick announcements before we get started with the reading. Um, the first is that registration is now open for Great Smokies summer classes. And we are so excited to offer three in-person options again. Um, this is our first return to in-person classes since spring of 2020 before March. Um, and we'll continue to offer some virtual classes as well. We'll have two classes via Zoom this summer. Uh, you can check out all of our course descriptions and register for the classes at our website. That's greatsmokies.unca.edu. And our second announcement uh, is a reminder that registration is open for the summer sessions of the Great Smokies Young Writers Workshop. This year, it's being offered as a pre-college program through UNC Asheville. The first week, um, session one, it's from June 19th to June 24th, and the classes are Nature-Based Writing, led by Mildred Baria, and World Building 101, led by Jameson Reidenauer. Um, and session two is that next week, June 26th through July 1st. And the classes are Limitless Poetry with Diamond Ford and Writing Ghosts, again, led by Jameson Reidenauer. Um, the cost of attendance, which includes everything in the pre-college programs, that's uh, overnight lodging in UNCA's residence halls, on-campus meals and field trips in addition to the classes themselves. Uh, the cost for all of that is um, $1,200, but we do have one complete scholarship available, the Corey Gross Scholarship for the Young Writers Workshop. Um, priority consideration for that will be given to students with financial need, and applications are open through May 15th. So if you know of any rising 10th grade through rising first year college writers, uh, please encourage them to check out the summer program and to apply for that scholarship. And all of the details for that can be found at camps.unca.edu under the pre-college programs tab. So that is all of our announcements. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the Poetry Masterclass instructor, Eric Nelson. Eric came to Asheville in 2015 after 31 years in higher ed, where he taught writing and literature at Virginia Tech and Georgia Southern University. His poetry has won many honors, including the 2015 Gival Press Poetry Award for his collection, Some Wonder, the XJ Kennedy Award for his collection, Terrestrials, and the University of Arkansas Press Poetry Award for the Interpretation of Waking Life. We're so lucky to have him teaching in the Great Smokies um, and especially lucky to have him here today to introduce our readers. So Eric, I will hand the mic over to you. All right, uh, thank you so much, Lily. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. I'm so excited about this reading and about the nine poets who are going to share their work with you. They are so accomplished and so experienced that even though I'm the sort of teacher of record, I really feel like just another member of the class and I learn something from them every week. So, uh, there's nine people in the class, there's 11 people in the class, nine uh, are going to be reading today. Two people couldn't make it, unfortunately. That was uh, Anne Marin Hogan. Don't feel too bad for her. She's in Ireland. Um, and Judith Davis. Um, the other people who are here and will be reading alphabetically by their first name are Elida Woods, Carrie Fry, Kathy Skye, Dana Lichty, Ginger Graciano, Kathleen Colby, Louis Heron, Paige Gilchrist, and Susan Rothline. Um, and we will start off with Elida. Uh, Elida Woods is a former teacher who has lived in Asheville for 47 years. She seems to know everybody in Asheville, my experience. Um, she says that the favorite part of her day is posting a poem in her neighborhood uh, three times a week. She's also the author of the poetry collection, Disturbing Borders, uh, which was published in 2018. This is what it looks like. Um, 
So, uh, Elida, start us off, please. Thank you, Eric, and thanks to the Great Smokies and to Malaprops for inviting us to read to you this afternoon. The first poem I'm going to read is written as a from a prompt in Eric's class this time, and it was an invitation to write an invitation. And this poem is called The Real Deal. Enough is so vast a sweetness. I suppose it never occurs. Only pathetic counterfeits. Emily Dickinson. I roll down the neighbor's grassy slope with my three grandchildren, the smell of mown grass pressed into my jeans. I unfold myself at the bottom of the hill and climb back up. Enough, I tell them. Rolling old bones is not wise. Yet it is enough to slide down hillsides, fight pirates, and tiptoe softly away at day's end. Not a counterfeit, not a stand-in for longing, but the real deal. The invitation I did not know I needed to find grace at my age. The invitation did not come in an envelope, but enveloped in the sweet stillness of summer afternoons, the smell of rain about to fall, the letting go. My therapist sister tells me this is what aging is, becoming nothing. But damn, it feels like something when the evening pinks and Jupiter winks in the twilight. I watch three squirrels scamper reckless down the hillside. I don't envy them. This next poem is called The Angle of Refraction. Wings against the spray, an osprey pockets the air under his great wings, lifts and dives, feet first into the fish rippled river, his eyes correct for the catch. We spend our lives correcting for the catch, teacher, not anthropologist, two husbands, not one perfect man. My mother, blind at 80, corrected her life. Daily, the ordinary became the extraordinary. Turn left at the intersection, she directed my husband from the back seat one night as we made our way through the pea soup of a Rhode Island night. We might have ended up in Boston, not Tiverton, but for her correction. And when I was sure I'd lose my virginity to the man I would love, I found myself on a hilltop overlooking Florence in love with the adventure of love. I once believed I would be young forever, turning cartwheels on the beach, walking the Camino. At 70, I hope for more grace, less vigor. We spend our lives correct, making revisions, catching what we can get, correcting for who we might have been. The osprey hoists himself, wings like the robes of Amenhotep, clutching the catch as he oars his way over the treetops. And the last poem I'm going to read is a gazelle. And the gazelle is a, um, a Persian or ancient Arabian type of poem. It's usually written in couplets, five or more. And there's generally some kind of rhyming or repeating pattern. Um, I wrote this a while ago. I altered a few words to make it a little more relevant for today. Um, another thing about a gazelle is also that the author's name can sometimes be revealed in the last couplet. This is called a gazelle of birds. In the tool shed, a wren has built a nest under the eaves. Dry winter grasses cradle three tiny eggs. She leaves. This morning, a chorus of robins breaks over the cove. They welcome day even before night leaves. As I gather my garden tools, I am eye to eye with Mother Wren. She has returned and I must leave. Today, a caravan of people at the border waits for entry to a country, from a country they must leave. Each day we watch from the porch with binoculars and wonder at her patience, hoping she will not leave. Children take, taken to strange cities have no idea why they are here or why their fathers leave. Wrens mate for life. The father carries food and bedding for the nest. The mother never leaves. Wrens have over 32 songs. How many songs are remembered by a child whose father leaves? Weedle de doo, come to me. It will be days before they fledge. We wait, we trust, we believe. 
In the woods behind my house, a tangle of bird song. These birds are migrants passing through. They will leave. Thanks so much. Wow. Thank you, uh, Lida. That was just beautiful. Um, our next reader is Carrie Fry. Carrie is a book editor and a writer who lives in Asheville. On the book editing side, she founded Black Cardigan Edit, where she works with writers to get their books scrubbed up to go out into the world. And on the writing side, she's working on her second novel, but has enjoyed adding poetry back into the mix through her classes at Great Smokies. Um, and we're glad she's added poetry into the mix as well. Um, so Carrie. Wonderful. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for being here today on this beautiful spring day. I am going to read two poems. The first poem was inspired by an incident about the poet Sylvia Plath, which has fascinated me for decades. In the summer between her junior and senior year of college, she was selected to be an intern with Mademoiselle Magazine. It was an extremely prestigious um, opportunity, only a small group of women across the country were selected. They were all in New York for a month. She later fictionalized this in the bell jar, where she also, of course, wrote about the breakdown she suffered later that summer. The anecdote has to do with something that she didn't write about in the bell jar, but that other people who were around her that summer remember, which is that at one of those lunches they went to, there was a bowl of caviar put out for the group and that Sylvia Plath ate the entire bowl by herself. That's what this poem is about and it's called Sylvia Plath in New York, age 21. My pockets full of stones with a stone for a head and a stone for a heart. I think of you emptying a bowl full of caviar at a fancy lunch. I like to think you meant to take just a spoonful, but then, but then. The fizz of brine on your tongue, a stream of itty eggs down your gullet, each swallow a jolt of joy. And then look, uh-oh, gone. Interviewed 30 years on, one woman still sounds appalled, as if like a goat you had mounted the banquet table and chomped the lacquered centerpiece to mulch. Oh, the barnyard gall, gall of you, stubborn hoofed alien, gauche underneath the gloves and shantong sheath. It delights me, your hunger, the methodical guzzling, a tableside mugging, a girl's disappearing of an Upper East Side luncheon's pièce de résistance. How hard we have to work all the time to be marvelous, to turn from stone into something that wants to live. Sometimes the only way to be is to be greedy, to find the ruby red thing you want most in the world and gobble and gobble it down. The second poem I'm reading is like Lida's from the prompt that we write an invitation, uh, thinking about invitations and poetry. So many invitations and poetry are between young lovers extending an invitation to slumber together. And it amused me to think about how those invitations change as the young lovers become old and old married couple. This is called Come to Bed. Come to bed, my darling, though you'd rather watch the movies end, but please instead come to bed where you will be hot and I cold and the dog will lick her nethers and the cat will clean a paw with diligent application. The two of them have it, having waited all evening for this time of congregation to really go to town. Come to bed, my sweet, to read a Jack Reacher paperback, and I will interrupt every so often to release bubbles of stray information like marital burping. On my side, I read a ghost story by Edith Wharton about a woman whose husband disappears one day, vanishes, vamooses. He has walked into the ether and she waits in their apartment for his knock. Jack Reacher has no wife, no address, no ID. Basically, he is the guy who disappears into the ether, 
But in your book, this is not a sad and eerie tale, but the start of an exciting adventure, wherein a man gets to roam around the country with no one ever saying to him, come to bed and big day tomorrow. And when will you be turning off the light and turn on your side, you're snoring again. In the Edith Wharton story, the couple have separate bedrooms and the last night they're together, the woman stands in the doorway and looks in on her husband, still and asleep in his bed. She loves him, but she does not go to him. I wish she had gotten in and notched herself to him in the dark to lie like baboons who rest in the bent grass together under the old stars of the original continent, fur to fur, nestled in immensity, not ghosts, not yet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carrie. That, that was, uh, as you said in the first poem, a marvelous, and you make it seem like it's not hard to be marvelous. So, <laughs> well done. Um, I, I'm not sure that Kathy Sky uh, made it, no. Uh, so our next reader will be uh, Dana Lichty. Uh, Dana wrote thousands of proposals, letters, and reports during her career as a fundraising consultant for the New York City nonprofits. Uh, after moving to Asheville in 2011, she signed up for the first Great Smokies writing course, thinking it was a prose course, but it was a poetry class, and she's very grateful for that confusion. Uh, Dana? Sorry, I'm having trouble unmuting myself. Can you hear me? Yes, you're all good. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, the first poem I'm going to read is called Caroscuro. I'll talk about it after I read it. Caroscuro, add vinegar. Then the egg whites won't fall apart, Mrs. Finney warned me. An hour into this job in a nursing home, expensive cells for bedridden women, I wondered if I would survive. The stakes were high. I needed the money. The place was run by the mother of the boy I loved, John Finney, captain of the football team. He got his mother to hire me, so I did what she said poured in vinegar, stood at the stove, flames licking the sides of a blackened pot, big as a cauldron, water boiling fiercely. 20 bleached eggs poached in there, bobbed like drowning swimmers in bathing caps. I waved the slatted spoon to fight off the acrid smell of hot vinegar. Later, white nurse's shoes squeaking, uniform glistening. I climbed the mahogany staircase with a heavy black tray, 10 bowls, two eggs each. I spoon fed the ghost ladies, mopped up dribble, tried to be kind, changed diapers and gowns, washed dishes, did the laundry. My workday done, John drove up in his new Corvette, bounced out, hugged his mother who pointed in my direction, proclaiming, she's good. John winked at me, opened the shiny black car door. Once inside, we kissed, long and hard. Let's go celebrate, he proposed. You look so damn hot and white. Don't tell mom, I enlisted. Going to Nam in June. After the Battle of Quezon, he came home in a silver casket. Never mind how good I'd been or how many eggs I'd flawlessly poached. His mother never spoke to me again. It took years, but eventually I flew to Washington DC to caress John's name engraved on a slab of polished black granite. So I just wanted to tell you that John is alive and well. 
Um, he was my boyfriend. He was the captain of the football team. And I did work for his mother in the nursing home, but he didn't die in Vietnam. Thank God. Uh, the second poem I'm going to read is um, about a recent experience of mine. And the title of it is, Why I Don't Want to Go to Heaven. Crystal clear bags dangle from a shiny silver stand as if an oversized diamond necklace. Lit by sunlight from floor to ceiling windows, looking out over the curvaceous Blue Ridge Mountains, each of the sparkling bags bears my name, plus a warning in ruby red, caution. Rack mounted devices with thick cords slither to wall outlets, produce constant beeps, hums, and chirps. With 20 or 30 of us in the room, it sounds at times like the symphony warming up. I sit with my laptop and try to write a poem I watch clouds and the crystal bags being shuffled from one end of the frame to the other. Finished, not finished. Two down, six to go. Nothing poetic happens. Vince, my nurse today, does his silly sommelier routine, announces the contents of each bag as if it were a rare French wine. Our favorite, Vin Christine, which will blister your skin if it leaks. I prefer Veuve Clicquot Brut, watching it bubble in a tall, narrow glass. I try to sip apple juice from a tiny carton that spurts all over me when I shove the straw in. I envy school children everywhere who know how to do this without spilling. In truth, I envy anyone who isn't in this room or one like it, but I'm not ready for heavenly exile, even though it may be a paradise where cherubs flit about and angels don diaphanous robes, where the music is always harmonious, wine flows and love abounds. I'm not ready. I have poems to write. So I want to uh, dedicate this poem to uh, my doctor and to the staff at the Messino Cancer Center, uh, where I've been recently treated, who are just the best. And this poem is for them. Thanks. That was, uh, that, was uh, that was wonderful, Dana. Uh, and of course, we're very glad you're still here. Also, uh, I'm glad that John Finney is too. Um, <laughs> our next uh, reader is Ginger Graziano, who is originally from New York City. She's a writer, artist, and graphic designer living in Asheville. Her poems and short stories have been published in Kakalak, the American Journal of Poetry, the Great Smokies Review, Stone Voices, and writing in circles, the art of soul making, uh, among many others. Her memoir, See, There He Is, was published in 2015. Uh, you can find her online at her website, which is www.gingergraciano.com slash writer. Um, Ginger, take it away. Hello. Okay, first of all, I want to thank, um, I think I love Eric's class and, um, and I, I'm so grateful to be in the Great Smokies program and that Malaprops has these classes. Um, so I'm going to read a poem from Eric's class. All these poems are from Eric's class. Uh, this was a, an invitation poem that we had. This is called Come Out for dawn. Come out, the moon rises like a tropical tangerine straight out of Florida, dripping light across the dappled porch. It's so easy to curl up safe inside, but remember the night we crawled from the tent 
as coyotes crooned love songs. Our hair rose with our bodies. Branches tattooed our faces blue gray. A possum toddled the path, led by her nose. Come out, let's dance in the meadow's rippling breath. Chase our long shadow, toss blue shawls over our head. Shed clothes in moon glow, turn feral as young love, filling the night sky with endless vistas, sizzling brighter than an incandescent galaxy. The North Star guiding us as we walk blind at night, misbathed in cool delight, feet faultlessly feeling our way. Wake up, let's crawl into the dark night, tiptoe past sleepers and to drive roads unlit with stars like freckles on God's nose. Okay. My second poem is called, and it's also from Eric's class, it's called Three Weeks Before Dying. I break my son out of the hospital. A giddy ride through Manhattan to score corned beef, whatever he wants. Drive across the Triborough Bridge, sun setting over the towers. He enters the house on Littleworth Lane. We pretend he can inhabit an earlier memory of peace and laughter. But he's just visiting, saying goodbye before he leaves for good. So little I can do except this gesture this 24 hour escape, as if we can fly away, ascend into a different story. But here we are, walking into the living room where our birds chirp hello. What must he feel like to enter this parallel world that moves unaware while he lingers suspended? I cook his favorite foods like I always do, my welcome home ritual. Tonight, Maureen and Jim come over, watch him eat and eat, eating life, sucking it up as if it can transport him back in time to when we joked and acted goofy. He's exhausted, too weak to climb the stairs, to rest on my bed. I have work deadlines pressing, but fuck it. I toss them aside to lie beneath him, to lie beside him listening to his breath all night, sleep not what I need. The dog snores lightly, red maple outside the window sheds leaves, becoming bare. This will be the last time he's home. I pray morning won't come, that maybe the sun, that leering eye, that fickle presence, that heat blasted dream destroyer, forgets to get up, sleeps late so that we can remain in this cocoon of normalcy. But slowly, the sky hints at dawn, a searchlight coming to find us. I have one more poem I can read. It's also from Eric's class and it's from um, a few years ago. And this one has been published, but um, I'm gonna read it. It's called Night Ride. Tony brings the car around. Glenda and I get in. Windows closed against the chill. No one talks about Jeremy, my dying son we just visited in the hospital. Not much traffic at 11 p.m. Lights turn red, then green. We blast through smoke rising from manholes. Ambulances roar past, bleeding, flashing. A half moon shines over the East River Drive. One of us says something, not even that very funny. Our laughter starts like a hiccup that won't be scared away. From the pit below our guts where dead things fester, howls ricochet off the windows. We are screaming, gasping, a wheezy calliope squeezed, monkey on our shoulders banging cymbals, helpless to stop. That's it. <laughs> thanks everyone thanks uh ginger uh those were really wonderful 
I, I love these stars like freckles on God's nose. Um, and the two poems that uh, have to do with your son are just really heartbreaking and heartwarming. Um, well done. Um, our next reader is Kathleen Colby. Um, she is a recovering corporate communications consultant and is emerging as a poet. She began publishing her work in 2019 and it has appeared in a dozen journals, awarded a Gilbert Chapel mentorship with poet Jessica Jacobs in 21. Kathleen also enjoys playing singing bowls as well as a short hike and a long cup of tea. Um, Kathleen? Thank you all. Um, and thanks to Eric and my fellow classmates who are terrific, um, the Great Smokies writing program and Mala Props, and all of you watching us today. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. The first poem I'm going to read is fairly nostalgic and an experience that many of you have shared. So it's called On the Line. Before machines droned hot air, wind blew life into shirts, blouses, aprons, underwear, and jeans. Towels from the bath, tablecloths for company, a mix of flowers, gingham, stripes, and solids, denim, flannel, linen, cotton, white sails of sheets always took first place. Told not to touch, who could resist running through their crests and troughs? Tunnels of light collapsed and swayed. Scent of grass and breeze came off the line, dried like this, Clothes were stiff, towels rough, sheets so crisp, we'd roll about wearing them into patches of softness. In rain or winter, wash hung on basement lines, limp as we felt on those endless indoor days. Banned from roller skating in its province or playing tag, we'd set up store or classroom in the corner, glare and grumble with command, hurry up and dry. Later, when a dryer arrived, we'd stare into the porthole, spy as blouses chased jeans, underwear tumbled into socks, clothes now were always warm and soft, but gone were the days of crisp sales. The next poem I'd like to read is called Mercy and 98 Other Names. And I'd like to explain that a little bit. In Islam, God has 99 names and the first name is mercy, mercy and 98 other names. Carnations given as apology, their petals like scissored paper, their scent of clove placed in my hands for my lover, who knows how I will nestle my face in their cluster, breathe in that request for forgiveness and likely embrace his kindness, the need for balance. Yet I think how they thrived in gardens of what was once Persia with roses, so close to God, you could smell her presence. Before the wars there bulleted and bombed such beauty, before the women screamed and men were hanged with their necks loose and all else dragged by gravity. What has become of the faithful's gardens? For those two were a prayer and the Quran praises them. I have read its passages delivered by an angel, its verses of compassion to widows and children, even non-believers. Now landmines bloom body parts, but I have heard the fountains rise with water to mist the desert air in home courtyards where with carnations and roses, fig trees and almonds, grow in harmony and stature. A breeze cools some evenings, seduces the devout to rise from their prayers and walk into beauty and the non-believers to pray, all fingering their beads for God's names, which begin with mercy. Even in rubble, the scent of clove remains. The last uh, piece I'm going to read is, uh, was based on a prompt to write an elegy in Eric's class, and it's a bit of family history. There's also a reference to um, actual history. 
in September of 1939, um, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, uh, seized it, and World War II began. And that has a consequence in this poem. Harvest of Ice. The air sharp as ginger, breath wisps like milkweed floss, bundled in wool, underwear to coats, men harness a horse to a cutter, plow straight across the frozen lake, again and again, till blocks move into a channel where another with a gaff waits, scuffs the snow with his boot, white flecks rise, light barely awake. Yet teams of men and horses begin to harvest ice. As I scan the photographs now, I remember how I leaned on grandpa's chair for stories about ice and Blackie the horse that fell through and wasn't seen again. But the one he never told was how, how in the world the ice houses burned one September. In pictures, he and his brother Rowan stand on Crystal Lake in winter. I knew the swing of skates on ponds, not the lug and pole, the gritted tooth of work in the cold. Those barns in the background, the ice houses, stored blocks big as granite year round. Sepia tones makes, make ghosts of the men. No empire, but grandpa and Rowan built a business with ice as the 19th turned 20th century. Demand grew even in small towns and more in cities. In Europe, World War I gassed soldiers. Electricity wired homes here for new appliances. Another war simmered. The ice houses burn as 39's fall began. Tonight, I dream of the lake, the photo in my hand. I stand where the men stood, pull a matchbook from my jeans, tear one red fingernail from the strip, strike it. The edge of the picture curls with flame, blooms into smoke. Everything becomes ash, everything except the lake. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. That was beautiful. Uh, it's such a fascinating story about ice, um, the, the personal history and uh, the social history that was going on around it. Um, yeah, I never had any idea that that's how ice was harvested. And I do feel very bad for Blackie the horse that fell in. Um, poor Blackie. Um, Louis Huron is our next reader. Um, Lou is a recovering neurologist and clinical pharmacologist. After a completed poem dropped into a budget for a research proposal, null hypotheses morphed into villanelles and dose response curves into sonnets and action potentials into palindromes. And we're glad they did. Um, Lou? Lou? Looks like he's uh, having some unmuting challenges. There we go. I there we go. Heard. Sorry. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, I have to say the, the workshop has been marvelous and uh, the participants are amazing, as you know. Uh, the, uh, I have to, uh, I'll be reading uh, one poem that requires some uh, uh, elaboration in terms of meaning. Reverse osmosis refers to a movement of particles at an opposite direction in solution. And uh, the other part of the title is Obad. And this is a poem uh, written at uh, dawn, usually characterized as a, a party uh, between lovers. 
And so the poem is about the, the night before and the, you know, the, the reality of the morning. So, and this was written uh, for uh, the workshop. It's called A Dream a Reverse Osmosis, A Kind of Obad. Above my gurney, a green scrub cap looms over a trim white beard. Likely, he meets no harm. His face is kindly. His voice, if prideful, matter of fact, as if he speaks of a known future. If only time, like molecules in solution, like my wishes, could run backward, backward from these bright lights and away from his words. If only our real time could stop, skip back only to our nights, and let us linger on the silk. He says, I will put you to sleep and keep you alive. The surgeon, she will cut open your heart. The second poem is a poem of invitation. This is one of our tasks during the workshop, but I had written this a little bit before that time, but I thought in the spirit of the workshop and what we've been doing, I might read it now. It's called Welcome. Welcome. Few visit our enclave. Many find our spiritual disciplines off-putting. Most do not return. A rare few join. Here, take my handkerchief. Our disciplines ensure that we in our order rise above and go beyond the flesh. Is weak or else, and depending on your meaning, strong, sweetly corrupting, and Satan's sure call, and thus must be denied. Defeated by any means, or as logic directs and our rituals extol, sacrificed. When I first came to this fold, the extremes of heat and cold were burdens, not the trivial challenges of today. I do have some feeling in the fingertips that are left. As a novice, I could not sleep on the bare stones of my cell. Conditions here are more open to nature and some would say more primitive uh, than I recall in prison. I did shed the skin of my previous life with a hope for grace and by daily practice, I did so for the promise of transfiguration from sinner to saved. I took to the devotions with a zeal that to this day remains the envy of my brothers. My body has been raised as an altar to God and to a battlefield between good and evil. The crown and my shirt are reminders, both substantive and symbolic of divine suffering and of human redemption. And for one at my level, they and the bleeding are constant. Knees are for kneeling in prayer or for the pilgrimage. It does not matter, or as the abbot says, it is only matter, and therefore it does not matter if they do not heal. Hold the cloth against your face. Cover your mouth. Prayers, reverence, not startled cries, must be the required responses from this point on. Your question is natural. Yes. Even when I laugh, wait. The ritual begins. I, ah, praise, but not when I pray, as I did in this just past portion of my devotions. Pardon. My breath was caught. Your poise is admirable. Brother Melvin has a strong arm, but not quite the strongest. Sometimes I help him at his devotions. Not then, certainly not now. I kiss the whip. Okay. 
Thank you, Lou. Uh, it was very well read. Um, I appreciate it. Um, our next reader is Paige Gilchrist. Um, after years of freelance writing and editing and a stint as editorial director for an imprint of art and craft books for Barnes and Noble, uh, Paige did what any self-respecting Ashvillian would do and left it all and earned her yoga teaching certificate. She is now teaching yoga, training teachers, producing a meditation podcast, and raising a teenager. She's grateful to be exploring poetry with the talented and supportive GSWP community. Um, and we're very glad you're here, Paige. Please. Thank you, Eric. It's so fun to be here with everyone. Um, so the first poem that I'm going to read is a poem of um, kind of pleading desperation. I, I feel maybe you've had this experience too, that over the last couple of years, so much has been kind of unpredictable and um, unreliable, unknown. So I've been clinging to those sort of... Um, pardon? Can you hear me? Okay, um, those sort of simple um, miracles that are just right outside the door and um, like the rhythms of the seasons. And for me, that is really embodied in this big, beautiful, full armed cherry tree in my yard. And this spring, just as it was about to bloom, we here in Asheville, if you're here in Asheville, you know, we had a snowfall and a deep freeze. And a friend of mine who is a master gardener said that was very likely mean that all of these trees were about to bloom just wouldn't this year. And I thought, no, we can't lose that too. And uh, turns out she was wrong, but I didn't know that when I wrote the poem. The poem is called Resurrection. Come on, my big body hug of a backyard cherry tree. Stay strong. Are you really going to let a little misplaced mid-March snap snatch away all the gaudy dazzle and froth you have in you? For weeks, I've watched your shiva splay of arms spiral and stretch, aching to be draped any minute in pink cream puff boas, Oscar Wilde, parading down Piccadilly. I've seen the nubs, zillions of unbuffed fingers at your wits ends on the verge of bursting into handfuls of confetti, an obscene spray of tiny cake decorations that will tossle in the wind and douse the deck after they sugar your every last limb. Yet ever since Saturday's dip down, when you slipped into a silver sheath of ice for the night, You've been distant, pouty, your buds tight-lipped and cold-shouldered. I never thought you'd be the kind to slink into spring wearing only scraps of lichen and thrift store army green. Pull yourself together, show some pluck. Sure, you'll eventually leaf and live, we all will. But I'm looking for more than survival, old friend. This year, of all years, I need to know we can rally be iridescent beyond reason. Like my whole family busting out hip hop in the kitchen on a Tuesday night, like sparklers, like you strutting brighter than a peacock on my lawn. And um, the second poem was written in response to a, um, a prompt to write, write about heaven. And so that made me think of two things. One is um, kind of how heartbreaking things here are on earth right now. And it also reminded me of um, something that a Zen priest said to me decades ago, it was kind of in the form of a little koan or riddle. That's how Zen priests like to talk. And um, it's really stuck with me both as a, um, a challenge and a possibility. So those things sort of wove together into this poem. It's called Nirvana or Not. And it begins with an epigraph of that, that teaching. Every moment the Zen priest said can be Nirvana or not. Every moment after my sink drips me awake at 4.37 a.m can be nirvana or not. I need to know how much in me is a seed of the suffering, 
how much to stomach. Every moment, said the Tibetan priests who set themselves afire to feel free, can be nirvana. The moment or not, the fire is lit on the Molotov wick, nirvana, on the lips of Ukrainian priests, deep in bomb shelters, offering Eucharist, as an old woman holds out a hand of sunflower seeds, nirvana to the gun of a young Russian soldier, just like her son, or not, the moment nirvana or not, my bright blue hyacinth sky extends to an Afghan man who said nirvana, he said would be just a needle and thread for a moment to mend his refugee clothes as if sowing seeds from a global vault where we saved them, nirvana, all of us or not, to stitch together what we've torn and scorched, to tack ourselves back to each other. Every moment, the Zen priest said, every moment, he said, can be nirvana or not. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Those are both beautiful and had such uh, wonderful rhythm and sound through, uh, throughout. And I'm um, very happy you gave that cherry tree a good talking to. That obviously is what made it bloom. Um, one more reader is Susan Rothline. Um, she's been writing poetry and taking classes through the Great Smokies program for 10 years. She finds inspiration in the everyday and sometimes in her dreams. Susan. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm going to read three poems that I have written during this class. Um, and I have appreciated so much all the feedback from all the class members. The first one is called Open Invitation. Please come again any night and stay a while. Give me more than a glimpse of your face, more than a slippery shadow from morning's last dream before I wake, left with wispy memory of a car ride, my amazement when the white haired driver turns to me and it's you. Please visit again. I want to climb back into that dream, reach over, touch your arm and say, hi, dad. See you smile, hear your raspy, well, hello there, Susie. Please stay a while. We could take our time, cruise through a balmy Florida evening in your yellow Mustang convertible. Stop at Pepe's Cantina and order the huevos rancheros you loved. We could linger over beers, laugh at family stories, the ones I'm afraid I'm starting to forget. Please come again any night and stay a while. The next one is wish list for heaven. May there be bowls of plump fresh blueberries and a pantry stocked with their jam for my toast. Dark roast coffee, smoky aroma. Bird song at sunrise announcing abundant blue skies, but also black cloud days, rumbles, flash, and dancing downpours. May dusks linger in pink sunsets and shared glasses of Pinot Noir with friends. May my lifetime of loved dogs romp together in the yard. The many cats will take turns sleeping, purring on my unhurried lap. Let there be radiant yellow daffodils, fat ruffled peonies, intoxicating lilac perfume in the breeze. May there be hands to hold, hugs and goodnight kisses. And please, May I keep the memory of my grandson's smile each time I read him the runaway bunny. His plea 
of again, over and over when we reach the end. And my last one is March morning. Through my kitchen window, the sun climbs behind a cluster of bare trees, illuminates lawns dotted with daffodils and stripes the sky pink. Yesterday's dishes clean in the drainer, last night's crumbs swept from the floor to-do list upside down on the counter. No texts or emails read, news scroll still mystery. Slow unfolding mornings, a gift of my eighth decade. In the yard, the dog and I putter. He sniffs under bushes where rabbits have eaten the crocuses. I find swells of blueberry buds, emerging bee balm leaves. I zipper my jacket against chilly air and remember an image from Ukraine. A woman about my age with a shivering dog zipped in her snow speckled parka, standing in front of broken brick and shattered glass rubble what used to be home. I imagine her a few weeks ago in her kitchen, sipping coffee, anticipating spring, jotting down garden plans. Her to-do list now buried under shards. I want to put my arm around her, bring her inside, share the oatmeal bubbling on my stove. Sprinkle raisins and cinnamons on the steaming bowls. Eat together while the dogs rest near our feet, chewing their biscuits. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Those were just wonderful. I just love the uh, sort of clarity of your poems and how sensory they are. And I love the kind of magical, hopeful image of the Ukrainian woman in the poem. Um, so I think Kathy Skye uh, has is here. Is that right? Um, I'm going. To, I don't see you, Kathy, but uh, I'm going to introduce you. I do see you. Hi. Um, I'm glad you made it. Let me introduce you. Uh, Kathy Skye is a musician and writer. Her short stories and poems can be found in the New Guard Review, Cacalac. The Speckled Trout Review, The Heron Clan Seven, The Great Smokies Review, Pine Song, and in her chapbook, Blue Egg, My Heart. She lives in Spruce Pine, North Carolina, with her two cats. Kathy? Yes, please unmute. You're... Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. I lost, I lost the invitation to this event on my computer. Instead, I joined as a guest and scrambled around trying to figure what was happening because the, you know, I, here I am, and I'm going to try and keep it short because I know we're toward the end. Um, the first one is called Elegy for 1952. I remember my pop-up as he savored his lemon meringue pie at the automat. The miracle of food behind tiny windows he could reach in and get. He grinned. What do you think of that, Kathy? He asked and winked. And everything, his gray Stetson with the black band, his gold tooth, the heavy clink of his coffee cup and saucer, the murmurs and further clinks from the other diners, a kind of drone and chime, was the buzz of his world, the adult world, the folks that put an end to evil and Christ back in his heaven and a good dependable Ford in the garage. All of it 
filling my young ears seemed warm, like the wedding chant of a remote Amazonian tribe I saw on TV once. Their voices shouting, good, 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 over and over and over. Well, the second one is an obad, an assignment that Eric gave us. Uh, an obad is a salutation to the dawn. He told us that at one time it was typically about lovers parting at dawn, but it's now kind of streamed out to be just about anything you want having to do with daytime coming along. Um, it's called At First Light. At first light for a while, things can just be themselves, escape the noose of their given names. The river navigates rocks, winds its way. The curled cat warms her nose under her tail. Morning mist spills down the steep path to dissolve in sunlight, leaving stones moist as it passes. Out a hospital window, the mountains shed their brown or orange. Open to the motion of cloud shadow across their curves. On a bedside screen, a neon green cursor draws a continuous jagged line of peaks and dips. A bathroom faucet drips on with no one to annoy a drop at a time. Water, metal, porcelain. How impenetrable is the privacy of things? They elude inky glyphs scrawled on paper. The wind chime makes music of the day's stirrings. While at my feet, the cat yawns and stretches, leaps across the grass. She never minds how her paw prints vanish behind her. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kathy. Those were just lovely. Um, I, I love both of those poems. Um, well, I think that I think that's a wrap, as they say. Um, Thank you so much. I loved hearing everybody read and uh, I'll turn it back over to Lily. Thank you so much again to all of our readers today. And thank you to Eric for co-hosting and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, so that wraps up today's reading. But if you want to join us for our next one, it will be on May 15th, celebrating the spring issue of the Great Smokies Review. So we'll hear from some folks who contributed to that issue. Um, another huge thank you to Malaprops for hosting us. Please consider um, supporting Malaprops and Eric if you want to get his collection Horse Not Zebra. Uh, you can pre-order it. Again, it comes out on April 18th. Um, don't forget to check out Great Smokies summer writing workshops at greatsmokies.unca.edu um, and spread the word about the Young Writers Workshop and the scholarship. So that's all for now, and we look forward to seeing you in May.